obviously they all interconnected in some way. Okay. Yeah, you know, it's always there. <laughs> okay, so um, so we hi, Alexander. So, in terms of um, of the timing, we will start with Lord de la Rodière, who is the chairman of the regulator, the ASCEPT in France, uh, of telecoms and uh, the parcel of services. Then we'll move on uh, with Yves Alexandre de Montjoie, who is at Imperial College, but I think joining us from Brussels. <laughs> I believe. And then we'll move on uh, to Philippe Val, who is, uh, as you all know, CEO of uh, La Poste. And finally, we'll get Pierre Regibo, um, who is a chief economics, uh, economist at DigiCom. So, without further ado, I suggest that we start um, with Laure. Um, each participant will have about 15 minutes, and then we'll have an open debate uh, uh, between, between them and also with us uh, in the room. Laure? Merci. Euh, messieurs les présidents, mesdames et messieurs, merci euh, de m'avoir invité et de me donner l'opportunité en tant que présidente de l'autorité de régulation des communications électroniques postales et de la distribution de la presse de participer à cette table ronde visant à s'interroger sur les voies et moyens de la politique de la concurrence et de la régulation afin de promouvoir une économie numérique loyale et, et inclusive. C'est un honneur pour moi de participer à cette table ronde car l'ARCEP s'est beaucoup investi sur ces sujets. Je suis donc heureuse d'avoir l'occasion d'échanger avec vous sur nos réflexions. D'abord, dès 2018, l'ARCEP a produit un rapport sur les terminaux que nous considérions comme le maillon faible de l'Internet ouvert. Et nous montrions en fait que le règlement européen visant à garantir la neutralité d'Internet sur les réseaux et aux fournisseurs d'accès à Internet ne s'applique pas sur les terminaux, euh, laissant en fait euh, une faille dans la neutralité d'Internet. Euh, pour offrir un service sur un terminal, vous le savez, il faut passer par un magasin d'applications euh, du fabricant, App Store pour l'iPhone, qui vous dicte ces conditions et vous n'avez pas le choix si vous avez un service à offrir, de passer par un autre magasin d'application. En 2019, nous avons produit une note sur les plateformes numériques structurantes et cette note identifie les défaillances caractéristiques des marchés numériques et met en exergue des problèmes d'ouverture de l'écosystème numérique. En 2020, nous avons répondu à la consultation publique de la Commission européenne sur le Digital Market Act. Et en 2020, nous avons euh, rédigé une note sur le remède aux problèmes posés par les plateformes numériques structurantes, où nous dressons un panorama des remèdes susceptibles de traiter les problèmes identifiés. Nous mettions en avant, par exemple, l'intérêt de la portabilité des données des utilisateurs, permettant de renforcer la liberté de choix du consommateur, ou encore l'ouverture des plateformes logicielles des terminaux à d'autres acteurs que le fabricant du terminal lui-même. Ces remèdes sont d'ailleurs inspirés du cadre de régulation des télécommunications. L'ensemble de ces travaux nous amène à penser qu'il est pertinent pour l'économie numérique qu'elle soit soumise à une régulation ex ante asymétrique. Pourquoi cette régulation ex ante D'abord parce qu'un nombre restreint de grandes plateformes numériques deviennent incontournables dans la vie des citoyens et des entreprises et proposent de nombreux services qui font partie intégrante de chacun d'entre de notre vie quotidienne, que ce soit Google, Apple, Amazon. Ces acteurs mondiaux sont en mesure de déterminer quel contenu et services peuvent être mis en ligne et à quelles conditions les utilisateurs peuvent y accéder. De plus, ils s'organisent pour maintenir les utilisateurs captifs au sein de leur écosystème. Alors, par ce biais, la liberté de choix du consommateur est finalement bridée. 
les effets de certaines de leurs pratiques sur les dynamiques concurrentielles et sur les acteurs du marché sont souvent irréversibles. Il est donc crucial d'intervenir avant que les problèmes concurrentiels ne se matérialisent. De plus, compte tenu des enjeux, notamment en matière de liberté de choix du consommateur et de dynamique concurrentielle, des caractéristiques du secteur fait de position hégémonique de quelques acteurs sur un marché, des pratiques des plateformes, d'ailleurs sanctionnées euh, ces pratiques, mais sans que les sanctions aient profondément changé les comportements des acteurs, nous pensons qu'il est pertinent qu'il y ait une régulation ex ante asymétrique. Donc, nous saluons l'initiative prise par la Commission européenne avec le Digital Market Act, qui représente une avancée majeure. D'abord, l'échelle européenne nous paraît le bon niveau d'intervention et l'Europe est créée précurseur, comme cela a été d'ailleurs en matière de régulation pour protéger la vie privée avec le RGPD. Et puis, c'est une régulation que nous appuyons de nos voeux, ex ante, asymétrique, s'appliquant donc à un nombre limité d'acteurs principaux. Et nous pensons que c'est un bon principe. L'ARCEP a d'ailleurs largement contribué avec l'autorité de régulation européenne, le BEREC des télécommunications, et avec le GREP aussi sur le DMA. Et nos positions sont alignées avec celles de, de, des deux réseaux que sont le BEREC et le GREP. Le BEREC et le GREP ayant pris des positions communes et collectives sur le Digital Market Act. Avec le BEREC, l'ARCEP note néanmoins trois points d'attention tout particuliers. Le premier, et c'est crucial, il convient de préciser les détails techniques pour que l'application de certaines obligations soit efficace, pour éviter finalement le contournement des nouvelles obligations qui sont incluses dans le DMA. C'est essentiel. Si je prends l'exemple de l'interopérabilité, l'interopérabilité, c'est la capacité du système à communiquer, à échanger des informations avec d'autres systèmes ou produits. Les détails techniques des interfaces ou des standards qui permettent cette interopérabilité doivent être clairs et transparents, partagés entre les différents acteurs pour que cette mesure d'interopérabilité soit efficace. La correcte spécification de ces détails techniques qui découlent d'une analyse est donc absolument cruciale pour que l'intervention de régulation envisagée atteigne ses objectifs. En second, second point, nous avons préconisé, donc le BEREC et l'ARCEP ont préconisé la création d'un groupe de haut niveau de régulateurs du numérique pour assister et fournir de l'expertise, des avis, des recommandations, des études à la Commission européenne, qui reste la seule responsable de la mise en œuvre du DMA. L'idée est bien de recueillir le maximum d'expertise pour alimenter la réflexion de la Commission, dont les moyens sont nécessairement limités en nombre. Or, l'expertise recueillie par les réseaux des régulateurs du numérique dans chacun des pays de l'Europe, de l'Union européenne, et leur analyse et leur expertise permet de compléter finalement les moyens de la Commission. Cette proposition qui a été aussi portée par le Parlement européen fait partie du compromis final à l'issue des triogles. En troisième, nous insistons sur la nécessité d'une bonne articulation avec les cadres réglementaires existants. Ce matin, j'étais à Dauphine, il y avait aussi un colloque sur la régulation du numérique à Dauphine, notamment sur l'intelligence artificielle. Et la CNIL disait la même chose. La CNIL disait aussi attention à bien articuler l'ensemble des réglementations européennes touchant au numérique. En ce qui nous concerne, nous sommes attentifs au fait que le DMA, qui amène une nouvelle régulation des messageries instantanées, en tout cas de celles qui sont retenues parmi les gatekeepers, donc on pense naturellement à WhatsApp ou Messenger par exemple, que cette nouvelle régulation s'articule bien avec le Code européen des communications électroniques qui permet aussi la régulation des services de messagerie instantanée. Euh, donc il sera crucial d'assurer que les dispositions du DMA et du cadre des télécoms soient appliquées de façon 
co cohérente au niveau européen. Et naturellement, le, le BEREC, tout comme les régulateurs des télécommunications dans chacun des pays, sont à la disposition de euh, la Commission européenne pour pouvoir travailler sur cet enjeu. Toutes ces propositions sont portées par l'ARCEP et le BEREC. Nous les avons soumises à consultation euh, publique, comme nous le faisons habituellement. C'est la façon de, de travailler des autorités indépendantes. Et nous l'avons testé finalement auprès des différentes parties prenantes, non seulement les, les gatekeepers, mais aussi les concurrents des, des, des gatekeepers, les utilisateurs professionnels, les associations de consommateurs, les représentants de la société civile ou des experts. Enfin, en ce qui concerne le secteur postal, l'ARCEP et les travaux du GREP, qui est l'autorité de régulation des services postaux au niveau européen, préconise de tenir compte des aspects concurrentiels liés aux plateformes de e-commerce. En effet, le développement des propres réseaux de distribution de colis des plateformes de e-commerce est de nature à avoir un impact significatif sur le secteur postal et son évolution. En effet, ces acteurs peuvent être amenés à développer des stratégies dites de « cherry picking » consistant à distribuer eux-mêmes leurs colis uniquement dans les zones rentables et de remettre aux opérateurs postaux, et en particulier aux prestataires du service universel, euh, les parties euh, non rentables de la distribution des colis, amenant ainsi euh, une situation concurrentielle, euh, sans doute au désavantage de ces prestataires euh, de services universels. Dans son rapport sur l'impact du développement des plateformes de e-commerce sur le secteur postal, publié très récemment en décembre 2021, le GREP a soulevé la question de la qualification juridique des plateformes de e-commerce actives dans le secteur postal. Considérant que les plateformes de e-commerce actives dans la distribution de colis devraient être considérées comme des opérateurs postaux et donc soumises aux obligations des opérateurs postaux. Le GREP poursuit cette année ses travaux sur le sujet et devrait notamment analyser, comme, comme nous l'avions d'ailleurs proposé, l'impact sur la concurrence entre les plateformes numériques de l'existence de plateformes verticalement intégrées sur la distribution de colis ou non. En conclusion, euh, les enjeux de, associés à la digitalisation et au développement des plateformes numériques sont sont nombreux et pressants, ils font régulièrement l'actualité, ils font régulièrement l'objet de décisions d'autorités telles que les autorités de la concurrence ou, euh, ou la CNIL, mais euh, ne, ne, ne demeurent pas for... enfin, ne... ces, ces sanctions n'ont pas forcément un effet euh, important sur leur comportement. Et donc, la proposition de la Commission et les contributions du Parlement et du Conseil euh, sont à la fois ambitieuse et vraiment intéressante, et nous les soutenons comme constituant une première réponse. Nous sommes euh, le réseau des régulateurs compétents en matière du numérique représente un soutien précieux pour la Commission, et nous pourrons fournir donc une expérience solide. Dans le domaine des télécoms, ça fait 25 ans de régulation ex ante depuis l'ouverture à la concurrence du marché des, des télécoms, multisectorielle, si on prend l'ensemble des, des autorités concernées par le numérique aujourd'hui, qui est crucial dans la régulation de ces écosystèmes de produits et services très variés. Dans ces secteurs dynamiques et innovants, la surveillance et l'analyse des évolutions du marché, et non seulement des gatekeepers eux-mêmes, mais des gatekeepers sur leur marché et les pratiques qu'ils ont sur ces marchés, sont des éléments clés. Via le BEREC, L'ARCEP contribue également à la rédaction de plusieurs rapports sur ce sujet. Nous co-présidons d'ailleurs un groupe de travail parce que vous avez compris qu'on était très allant sur ces travaux au niveau européen au sein de l'autorité de régulation des, européenne des, techno, des, des télécommunications. Nous avons un premier rapport qui va sortir en juin 2022 sur l'analyse de l'écosystème de l'Internet afin d'identifier les enjeux de demain et une analyse aussi technico-économique de la mise en œuvre des mesures d'interopérabilité concernant les services de messagerie instantanée. L'idée est de savoir là comment euh, on utilise les nouveaux pouvoirs euh, 
confiée au régulateur en matière euh, d'obligation de, d'interopérabilité concernant les services de messagerie instantanée. Et d'ailleurs, à ce, ce titre-là, ça sera très intéressant d'avoir de, 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 des discussions sur l'application du DMA sur ce point précis. Permettez-moi en conclusion aussi de rappeler qu'à côté euh, de ces principes euh, fondamentaux d'ouverture à la concurrence, qui sont à l'origine de la création et qui sont la base de travail des autorités indépendantes de régulation des communications électroniques et des travaux que nous menons pour assurer une plus grande liberté de choix du consommateur, l'ARCEP a ouvert un nouveau chapitre de la régulation, un nouvel axe que nous initions grâce à la compétence juridique que nous a confiée récemment le Parlement. Il s'agit de concilier le développement des usages du numérique et la réduction de son empreinte environnementale. Nous sortirons prochainement notre première enquête pour un numérique soutenable. C'est un axe de régulation que nous avons souhaité porter parce que c'est une attente forte des citoyens qui s'est d'ailleurs invitée dans le débat public au moment du lancement de la 5G. Et nous pensons qu'en matière de régulation, nous devons prendre en compte ces enjeux pour pouvoir fournir par la régulation par la donnée, des informations aux parties prenantes afin qu'elles puissent se positionner et ainsi nous les incitons à avoir un comportement plus vertueux. Je vous remercie. Well, thank you so much uh, for this very nice uh, talk. Um, we are going to move on to Yves Alexandre and I'm sure we'll get back to interoperability and uh, data and privacy and topics like this. Am I right? No, absolutely, actually. Uh, should we do it in French or English? I, if you have any preferences. It's in English, yes. English, English, yes. sounds good. Perfect, perfect. I had prepared the remarks in English, so that's great. Right. Um, so first of all, thanks a lot for uh, the invitation to uh, participate in this panel. And, and my apologies for not being able to be uh, with you in person in sunny Toulouse. Uh, it could have been a pleasure. Um, So basically, I just want to make sure that I'm leaving enough time for uh, discussion, uh, which I think is going to be the most interesting part of the panel. So I really try to keep my remark uh, quite short, um, you know, five to 10 minutes. And basically a few, you know, kind of technical observation from my perspective uh, since the publication of uh, the report uh, to Commissioner Versteyer uh, that we did with uh, Jacques. Yeah. Yeah. Would you mind speaking up a little bit? Oh, no, of course. Yeah. My, okay. Is this better? My apologies. Um, so yeah, so I just want to make sure that I'm going to give uh, you know enough time for uh, the discussion. So I make sure that I keep my remark uh, to be to be very short uh, and basically a few technical uh, observations from my perspective uh, since the publication of the uh, report uh, to Commissioner Versteyer with Jacques Remer and Heiko Schweitz. Uh, I should also emphasize that obviously it's uh, all of this is only my uh, personal opinion. Uh, as I'm currently a special advisor to the Justice Commissioner on AI and privacy. Um, so basically, I think I mostly have five observations since the publication of the report that I thought would be of interest for this discussion. Um, the first one is linked to data and machine learning models. I think even more than before and even more than in 2019, Uh, we've seen uh, the most recent machine learning techniques and in particular uh, self-supervised uh, learning models uh, requiring more than ever uh, extremely large amount of data. Uh, I think this is something that we had already emphasized in the report and it's something that's even more true today. Uh, just to give you, a, you know, an order of magnitude, uh, language models uh, trained last <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry, but uh, at least for me, uh, it's a little bit hard to hear you. It's not oh, loud enough. Maybe my apologies. Do you want me to try? Like, I can switch. Or maybe uh, turn on the sound of your mic, of your microphone, or something, because we we have a hard time. At least I have a hard time following. Uh,
Okay, my apologies. Is this better? Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Can you hear us? Shall we switch the order and then get back to you? Philippe. Okay, so I suggest that um, we change the order uh, while this technical issue is resolved. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so we are going to have Philippe uh, Val actually speaking now. Um, so why don't you do go ahead and then we'll go back to... Okay, okay, I will do that. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, in fact, four years ago, in the same town, and in another room of TSE, we were addressing two questions. Should digital platform be regulated? And if yes, how to do it? Those two questions are very interesting because they are showing that the world has changed a lot. Why? Firstly, the world is now far more digitalized. And on the regulation side, we have major events which are occurring. On Thursday, the 24 March, European Parliament and European Council agreed with the EC, the European Commission proposal about DMA, Digital Market Act, which is a major type of ex ante regulation. This is a major change. And Thursday last week in Washington, DC, uh, the American Innovation and Online Choice Act, which could be named as a US DMA, has been able to have a new hurdle, a new step in the process before becoming a law. So those two examples could, can show you that, that we have made significant progress on the awareness about the digital platform and on the regulation, especially with this ex ante regulation type. Significant progress. However, this is not the end of the question. Why? Why? Because those platforms are becoming more and more important in the economy and in the society. In fact, we could say that the GAFAM 
or the BATX, Chinese form of GAFAs, are not only becoming dominant players, they are at the heart of economy and at the heart of the society. They are firstly, I think, uh, working very well and bringing us infrastructure, services, and for instance, in La Poste, we are seeing those operators as benefiting both to consumers or to companies. And from my own point of view, I am seeing them as major factors of change, major factors of acceleration in growth and in change. But there is a dark side of this influence. And this dark side is that all those platforms have now established dominant position through killer acquisition, which does mean acquiring potential future competitor with very high prices using a monopsony or a monopoly position, bundling strategy to look up the consumers or planned obsolescence of their network or devices. So at this stage, I think that we could say that their position of market domination is an issue for everybody, which leads me to a second conclusion after the fact that we have to recognize that major change happened and that we have made progress. My second conclusion is that we have now to prepare a second step in regulation. We can't just be satisfied with DSA, DMA, and the new coming American uh, law about those platforms. Because I think that those platforms are becoming more and more powerful. In the economy, they are. Uh, stimulating, challenging, not only industrial operators like La Poste, and I will give you example of that, they are also challenging regulation authorities. How are they stimulating a very old company as La Poste? Very old because we are now in our six centuries of activity which could be qualified as very old. And we are stimulated. We are challenged by them, especially by Amazon. As you are working on the competition regulation, as you are teach in economics, what is our situation with Amazon? Amazon is our first client. And at the same time, Amazon is our first competitor. I repeat it because it's not so easy to understand. Let's imagine the situation when your first B2B, your first client is also your first competitor. So in fact, for now 10 years, I think that Amazon has been a major factor of change for our organization, which is good which is good if everybody in the market is respecting a same level playing field, which is precisely the issue of regulation. So La Poste and uh, its 250,000 employees are committed 
to be challenged and to adapt to this situation and to the market power of Amazon. I think that is exactly the same for the regulation authorities. And that's why I was speaking about the second step of regulation. I think that self-regulation is not far from being not very efficient. This was an English understatement. Secondly, code of conduct are not very efficient. The traditional competition regulation is very good. It's very good and uh, monitoring market share by uh, judges or by the EC, the European Commission, is very effective. It is not sufficient, but it is very effective. DMA is a great hope of effectiveness of the regulation. However, I think that we should work on new forms of regulation. I think that both the regulators and the political authorities have to adapt themselves, like the companies like La Poste. It does mean that they have to accelerate their own production of rules and of regulation. Because the context of digital platform is that everything in the world is moving far more quickly. Which is leading me to my last conclusion. The digital platform power represent a permanent challenge for regulation authorization. The regulation authorization should change themselves at the speed of the market and at the speed of all the operators, which is a big challenge for such organization. Because if it is a challenge for Amazon and GAFA's competitor to adapt, it is also a big challenge for the institution and for the regulation authorities to adapt, which does mean at the end of the day that we as competitor to those platforms have to create a new business model, a new paradigm, but at the same time that regulation authorities or political authorities should also invent and create their own new paradigm to be able to manage those digital platforms. Well, thank you very much, Philippe. It's very interesting and we are the message. Uh, we all have a lot of work. People in this room, both academic and regulators, have a lot of work to do. Uh, you love the first episode and uh, we are happy to offer you now episode number two with Alexander Return. Thank you. Hopefully it's going to work better uh, this this time. Um, so as I was uh, saying, basically, I just want to, I'll, I'm going to keep my remarks to be fairly short, a few minutes, as I really want to leave time for the discussion uh, and just limit them to a few. Basically, what I see as technical observations since the publication of the report was uh, Jacques Remer and Eike Schweitz. Um, the first one basically relates to the recent evolution in machine learning techniques. I think in the report, we already emphasized the, the fact that machine learning models are largely dependent on the availability of large amount of data. I think it was true then. I think it's even more true today with the most recent self-supervised uh, learning techniques that require even more data than before. Uh, just to give you a sense and an order of magnitude, when you look at, you know, modern, you know, last year, basically, language model that were trained by Microsoft and NVIDIA, uh, the Megatron Turing, basically, it's a, it's a model that has inside its, its architecture 530 billion parameters. There's 530 billions variable 
within that model that are basically learned from data. And in a recent paper, Google researcher Okay, even it's not very, you're stuck. Uh, we, see. Uh, that's a bro, that the connection this time, which is um, terrible. Oh, yeah, you're, you're back. I'm back? Okay. You're back. Okay, sorry about this. I tried to switch to 5G, so hopefully it should be more reliable. <laughs> <laughs> um, where was I stuck? I don't know. Yeah, you, you had a very large number. Okay, a very large number. Uh, 530 billion uh, is, is the last one probably. Um, so yeah, I think basically, um, so large scale language models uh, today have an extremely large number of parameters. And again, I think the 530 billion uh, just helps you know, put things in perspective in terms of the flexibility of these models and the amount of data that is gonna be required to train these uh, models, as well as the deep pockets that are required to basically create these models. And importantly, I think such models are extremely uh, general, they're self-supervised and can be then applied to a very broad range of applications. So I think this makes um, a lot of the comments we made in the report and the importance of the availability of data uh, even more pressing today than it was in 2019. The second one uh, has to do with uh, what we called back then protocol interoperability, basically ensuring that two systems can fully work together and that complementary services uh, can still be uh, can be provided. That is, at least in my uh, opinion, uh, still a challenge in practice uh, today. It is a challenge when it comes to IoT devices, but it also is a challenge when you look, for example, at browsers, uh, which you know today we're really seeing kind of a fragmentation in what kind of browser are, for example, being supported by specific. Uh, services. The third one has to do with data interoperability, uh, which is something that we talked quite a lot about in the report and that I think has been taken very seriously by the Commission, uh, in particular, when combined with a ban on self-referencing. I think this is, this is really great. Uh, however, I think the challenge moving ahead, as pointed out by Madame de la Rodière, um, will be how to implement uh, the requirements in ways that are going to be meaningful. How are we going to make sure that APIs can be relied on, can be accessed on reasonable terms, um, that we can ensure that the important data is indeed available and accessible through these APIs, and all of this while ensuring a high level of security and privacy, both in theory and practice. And I think this is going to be a major challenge uh, moving forward. The fourth point is relates to last minute changes that I think we've seen from the European Parliament um, to include what we have called in the report full interoperability. Basically, the ability of competing services uh, to interoperate, more specifically in this case, messaging systems. Uh, that will now have to allow you to basically send messages from one system to another. This is something that at the time we had emphasized requires much deeper integration and standardization than protocol interoperability. I think we've seen quite a lot of backlash in particular on how to ensure interoperability while maintaining high level of privacy and security in particular with regard to end-to-end -end encryption. And then finally, I think a lot has been happening in online advertising and digital privacy. Cookies are being phased out by browsers. New privacy preserving uh, systems are being proposed. Google announced Topic API, basically an on-device mechanism for targeted advertising. While Meta and Mozilla announced a privacy preserving attribution mechanism based on secure multi-party computation. 
this, these are really interesting developments. To me, they really reflect the increasing social unacceptability of mass surveillance practices, as in fact were emphasized in Professor Steuer's recent paper. Basically aiming, us, aiming at making us click on ads and, and really also sensitive and identifiable this data is. And I think these initiatives, because they really touch at the core of the advertising industry, targeting and attribution are likely, like the privacy sandbox before them, to raise competition concerns and to require a very detailed technical analysis of the trade-offs and ultimately the choice being made. So these were just basically five observations from the field that I've seen happening since the report that I thought I would you know, um, throw in for discussion. Thank you. And my apologies for the technical glitches. Thank you so much, Yves Alexandre. That was uh, very interesting. And uh, now we conclude with Pierre Gibault. And uh, we started with a regulator. We end up with a regulator as well. Well, thank you for having me. And of course, everything I say is just my own opinion. I don't know a single of my colleague who would trust me to toe the line. So that's that's my own. Uh, we all have agreed so far that there's a need for regulation. So what I'm going to do is talk about the specific regulation we're introducing, the DSA, but especially the DMA, and ask you know why we're we introducing it. What is the logic behind the approach? How do I think that we can implement it? And what are the problems we are likely to run into? Now, I mean, in terms of why we need regulation, that's not that surprising. You know, in many other fields, we've got some complementarity between competition law and regulation for a long time. You know, think about the pharma sector. So that's, that's really not new. And we know the theoretical advantages of regulation. You know ex ante what the requirements are. So it contributes to uh, what they call judicial or juridic certainty, which might decrease uncertainty linked to investment and so on. And also maybe the delays for review and decisions are kind of shorter, especially than in antitrust, where the delay can be very long. Let's point out, however, that those comparisons must be careful because when you look at the delay in antitrust, for example, a big part of those delays come from the litigation process, which in itself comes from the parties having rights and rights of the parties. And the rights of the parties tend to be uh, a bit less extensive under regulation than under the review of competition policy. So there's no free lunch. You gain something, but you kind of you lose something. So beyond this kind of traditional advantage of regulation versus competition policy, what are the rationale here? One part of the DMA is very simple. We do not at the EU level have a very strong mandate to look at what is called unfair practices. Local authorities, local uh, competition authorities routinely have those unfair practices as part of their remit. It's very vague under EU law whether we have this remit or not. So introducing a regulation that can deal directly with those kind of unfair practices, you know, transparency in dealing with the people on your platform and this kind of stuff, which really do not require in-depth analysis of market structure or even behavior or effects of behavior is just fair play. That's something that really should be done through regulation and that, that fills a hole, if you will. Another thing is that, you know, we, we do examine cases and then sometimes determine that in a given case, a given type of conduct was indesirable, could have anti-competitive effect or had anti-competitive effect. But then what if somebody else does it in the same industry or in another industry, we have to run another case again and another case again, right? And they might even know that they're going to lose eventually, but you know, it takes a while for us each time to run a case. So once we've looked at a given question for a number of times, it seems efficient for all parties to kind of enshrine our previous review into a principle, you cannot do this. There's always, of course, a trade-off between time one and time two errors, but when you've looked at the same practice for a number of times, I think the trade-off says that you should move it to the regulatory realm. Okay. These are the obvious reasons. There are, however, kind of deeper reasons why we also need something like the DMA. And that has to do with the structure of competition law, where, as you know, our main two articles are 101 and 102. 
And both rely you know, on dominant or at least significant market power. Well, we know that you do not necessarily need to be dominant or have extremely significant market power for some conducts to actually create damage in the market, especially if you are big in absolute term, even if you don't have very, very large market shares is in a number of operation. So in that sense, it's again a compliment. We're not saying the competition policy is wrong. We're saying the competition policy has been designed to deal only with situation of very significant market power and of dominance. And besides this, there's a range of situation where damage to the cooperative process can arise and we have to deal with those. And that's where we get this concept of gatekeeper. It's not defined in terms of market share. Actually markets are barely defined in the DMA is defined in terms of being big, absolutely, the European economy and being tentacular in the, in the sense that your presence in a different set of sectors of industrial activities. And the very fact that you're big means that even if you're not dominant, what you do might matter. And this is amplified by the fact that you're tentacular, you can in fact not just one sector, but many sector of activities. So that, in my view, is a main reason for the DMA. So, other ancillary reasons that have more to do with some difficulties that we face in enforcing 101 and 102. And in doing this, I never want to suggest that we turn to the DMA because we're not able to prove our cases through 101 and 102. I'm not saying that once we establish dominance, we have a case, we really don't like this conduct, it smells bad, but somehow we cannot satisfy the burden of proof. This is not something we try to get around. This is not something we should get around. So the burden of proof that we should, uh, that we should be faithful to. But where we've run into trouble is in the definition of dominance itself. And there are essentially two kinds of troubles. The first one is to do with market definition. As you know, the definition of dominance as actually is the legal definition is not in terms of market share, but de facto for judges, it's in terms of market share, which means that in order to argue dominance, you need to compute markets. And we already know that for economists, it's not always you know, that obvious as you define the market meaningfully, whether it's a single relevant market, whether you can define it in different ways, all of the variable. Those problems are even worse in the digital world. Why? Because you've got those platforms that are decided. There's more room for price discrimination. Different sellers have different information about the same kind of buyers. All of those create really big difficulties to define markets in what we would think is a meaningful way. So because of that, we might not be able to easily prove dominance, even if we feel that there is dominance. So there are other reasons like Tipping. We know that some markets with network effects tip. If uh, you know that after you reach a market share of 25%, the market is going to tip, then it's probably fine. And we should define dominance from 25% on. So courts will not follow us on this. Then finally, although we can in theory base a case on joint dominance, this is an area where the courts have not followed us easily. And that gives you some difficult situation because if you look at Apple versus Android, for example, they each pretty big, together they're certainly dominant, but if you cannot argue joint dominance, finding one of them, you know, a single dominance in all or majority of the European market is not necessarily going to be something easy. So that's another more fundamental reason why we do need something uh, like the DMA. Now, Another interesting aspect of the DMA goes back to what I told you about this, this gatekeepers being tentacular. And tentacular gets back to something we've discussed a lot in this conference, which is this system competition, this ecosystems, right? So I, in my mind, another very fundamental aspect of the DMA is that it looks at the digital world, or at least the, the part of the digital world we're looking at with a big platform, it says, it's a strange landscape. It's a landscape we really haven't seen that much before, where you have a few constellations, I call them death stars, that are the system, the center of the system. Whether they completely direct the system or not might depend from one to the other. But it's the center of systems. And then floating in the space are the smaller stars or you know, atoms or molecules. There are people who are very good at one thing. And what we try to do is create an environment where both kind of models 
of business model, both kind of players can compete on using uh, an expression that you've already used on a level playing field. And that's in that sense that I personally uh, understand the concept of contestability, which is at the core of the DMA, is to make sure that without certainly discouraging at all the behavior and the development of those big stars and actually maybe, maybe encouraging them to compete with each other, we also want to make sure that there's room in this space for the smaller fish to fry, to, 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 to thrive, not fry. They get fried, <laughs> we want them to thrive. Just a little difference in words. So that's, that's, that's kind of my general view of, where, of why we need the, uh, the DMA. Now, how is it likely to work? Well, your guess is as good as mine, but clearly we even don't know who's going to enforce it. It's gonna be some combination of probably DG Connect and, uh, and DG Comp. And whoever gets kind of the central power on it, there should be a dialogue between the two because we have different expertises. <laughs> so what do I see things? I see things where really the DMA can be applied without talking to DGCOM or to the traditional part of DGCOM. And again, this is kind of this unfair trading, so thing we've looked at again and again and again. So also things that are fairly, fairly simple and straightforward to apply. Look at the bundling. Usually I would say bundling, that's a tough question that has to be looked at by competition authority. But here it's just been defined. The only kind of bundling is bundling between core platform services. And there I think, you know, these are such big things that finding a situation where you could credibly argue that uh, uh, compensating efficiencies to this kind of bundling would be hard. So I'm fairly comfortable to let that, that be dealt with a DMA without further references to us. Now let's move to things like interoperability we've talked about. Okay. Again, it's both a technical issue, but it's also an economic issue in the sense that there are different kinds of interoperability, right? You can have interoperability of data. That's something I would encourage. What does that mean? Is that data would have to be kept in a number of preset format so that if there are situations where they need to be exchanged and so on, they can do so, they can be done readily. That's fine because this does not presuppose access to somebody's infrastructure. Other kind of uh, interoperability does presuppose access to somebody's infrastructure. I can you know, use my software with Windows, right? So I get access to the Windows infrastructure. This, that's an economic issue because we know there's gonna be a trade-off between granting this access, making sure that the build of the infrastructure is properly rewarded, and also making sure that the others keep sufficient incentive to create their own infrastructure so that we also have infrastructure-based competition. But that's, that's pretty standard stuff. And that's the kind of stuff that regular regulators have been used to dealing with, well or not, we can judge for a long time. So that too, I'm fairly comfortable to let to the DMA. But when you get to things like, uh, you know, self, self preference, we have one case that still need to be appealed that defines self preference in a very, very specific situation. I personally wouldn't want whoever gets charge of the DMA, be it DG Connect or a special part of DGCOM, to extrapolate directly from this one decision and say, well, in your case, it's going to be in this and this and this. If they can find an agreement with the companies, maybe, but I think that in that case, there will be a lot of payoff for having kind of further competition law case that look at this in detail. Final point, does this all mean that there's, never going to, there's not going to be much enforcement of, of competition law as opposed to the DMA in the digital sector? Certainly not. First, this is just a small part of the digital sector. It's going to increase a few years from now when we finally designate La Poste as, uh, as a gatekeeper. We're already planning on it, so, 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 so prepare, pre prepare your defense. But we only look at one part of the digital world. So all many other parts, including you know, AI algorithm and so on, uh, where so DMA is not going to have any impact. So in those parts of the digital world, we're still going to be relying mostly on a competition policy. We also see responsible of mergers. There's really nothing about merger uh, in the DMA. Also the DMA is really, most, it's about unilateral conducts. It's not about, you know, collusion, facilitating tactics and so on. And then finally, I don't think the DMA 
should be applied directly when there's a brand new conduct. And so the brand new conduct and those will emerge directly because of technical change and directly because, you know, once you make something a no-no, people find way around it. I think uh, very new conduct should always start with an in-depth uh, investigation and therefore under competition policy. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Excellent. So we had a great a dream team and uh, that showed. Uh, I have lots of questions, uh, including on him. Well, of course, we want to know about La Poste as a gatekeeper, but also the, the you know, interoperability I and mean, the other friend requirement, for example, uh, containing the DMA going to work, even that we know that friend doesn't work that well itself. What can we do? Uh, what about uh, privacy, which was mentioned by Yves Alexandre on encryption. There was an article in the FT two days ago on, on exactly this issue. Um, there are issues about the burden of proofs, including for killer acquisition, I guess. Uh, uh, there are issues about uh, unfair practices and uh, should they be left to national authorities? There are issues about the location of, uh, of authority. I mean, uh, uh, basically, Digicom versus uh, DigiConnect, and uh, you have the same debate actually in uh, national authorities, and for example, the UK, um, and many, many more questions. I mean, this, this was very exciting. So, what rather than ask a question, I, I suggest that you first we have a very brief sequence in which you basically comment on each other if you have questions about each other's uh, uh, presentation, and then we open the discussion to the floor. Um, so I don't know who wants to start for the first sequence. Yes, I, I will. Uh, I will answer the question of La Poste as a gatekeeper. Um, it is not our strategic objective. However, if it uh, would happen, we would be a very good gatekeeper. <laughs> Why? Why? Firstly, and I am very kind to share it with you. We are looking for profit. We are not looking for the maximization of profit, which is changing the behavior of a company. Secondly, as having the responsibility of four public services mission, we could be a good gatekeeper. Thirdly, we don't try to develop our own measure of domination. We are respecting the regulation environment and we be followed by regulation authorities, KPI or criteria. So that is why I think that we would be a good gatekeeper. And that is why I am very serene if it would happen one day. J'ai une question pour prolonger uh, uh, um, Monsieur Rejabot. Uh, comment en fait on devient un, un nouveau gatekeeper? Comment la, la Commission européenne va monitorer le marché pour détecter des nouveaux gatekeepers Parce que je sais bien qu'ils doivent d'eux-mêmes aller se présenter à la Commission européenne en disant oh, « je rentre dans, dans, dans les critères des gatekeepers », mais comment allez-vous faire enfin, en pratique bon, bon, uh, 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 As you know, there are, there are two, two ways into being a gatekeeper. One which is automatic based on numbers. And there, if you fulfill these numbers, you have to declare yourself. Fine. And frankly, that's not that hard to monitor. There are not that many companies who are hovering around those numbers. Uh, if they don't declare themselves, we will see them. For the rest, these are mostly, you know, again, numbers matter if you're not big, but you know, we're talking more about companies that are only really, really big on one set of core services. Right. Think about Amazon, for example. Right. And when there you have more of a quantitative uh, judgment. Okay. 
So again, normal, normally they're supposed to, to self-declare, but again, you know, we do monitor the markets all the time. You know, we do monitor markets looking for cartels, which is much harder than looking for markets for our companies that might be, you know, close to the limit so that we can send them requests for information. So that's what is that the way we would we would proceed if without, you know, intimation that they haven't done anything uh, uh, wrong, send requests for information for, to, or to determine whether they've become a gatekeeper or not. Maybe also on this point, and especially on the ex ante regulation, why is it so important? Because of the question of agility of the regulation. If you are following a traditional way of regulation, you are always following the behaviors of the operators. Taking the ex ante regulation, you have more agility to prevent any misconduct. So I think that as everything is about speed, you are able to be more efficient, more quickly. So I think it's something very important to have this type of regulation. Uh, uh, maybe a comment on this. I, I don't agree, but there is a trade-off in the sense uh, having speed so that you kind of orient uh, the industry before this kind of bad behavior appear implies that you're pretty sure that those behaviors are bad, right? Yeah. So let's give access to, to the platform to Eva Alexandre. You have something to add? Uh, yeah, actually, I wanted to jump in on your comments on uh, privacy and security, uh, which is, you know, kind of what my my day job uh, as a computer science researcher uh, is. Um, I basically see two things. The first one is on data interoperability. I think they, 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 they have been a lot of talks that somehow data interoperability would run counter to GDPR. Uh, and I do think that this is really a misunderstanding because again, if done under the control of the individual, you do have a very clear GDPR legal basis, which is the consent of the person. So really from a, from a legal perspective, I, I really do not see this to be an issue. I think the, the challenge uh, when it comes to data interoperability and privacy is really going to be how do you prevent uh, the issues we're seeing today with subject access requests of how do you authenticate people? How do you make sure that you do not give data access uh, from one person to another person? How do you prevent the system from being game or used for hacking uh, into people's account? Um, and how do you prevent, you know, another Cambridge Analytica? Uh, how do you make sure that when the data is, is transferred, there is still some level of controls so that the individual can give consent for the data to be used, but does not have to himself or herself go and check the details of every single website that's going to ask access to uh, the data? And that is a really tough question. And the goal is really to prevent, you know, another Cambridge Analytica. Uh, but also, again, it's it's a tough one. But Cambridge Analytica was also not prevented at the time. Since then, we've been developing quite good, you know, solutions, auditing, and others to make sure that the data was used uh, properly. On full interoperability, uh, which I know to be kind of the traditional interoperability in, in competition and into an encryption. Uh, I think you pointed this one out. I think it's a, it's a really hard one. Uh, I think we've, we've seen, as you said, a lot of people you know, taking to social media, writing op-eds to basically complain uh, that this was like you know, another example of Brussels not understanding technology, uh, even before the reading the text in details. Um, I think, as we said, Back then in the report, it's, it's much harder. It requires a level of standardization uh, that you know, goes much, much, much deeper than protocol and data interoperability. Uh, some people seem to believe that you know, a, a centralized, you know, some solutions might exist that would preserve end-to-end -end encryption. Fixes have been proposed, but 
but I think you know it's not guaranteed that they would um, keep the same level of uh, privacy than what we have uh, today with uh, with end-to-end -end encryption. So this one is a, is I think a really tough one uh, and might require you know quite extensive standardization before we can do it. We can do it right. Okay, thank you. I suggest we open the discussion to the floor. So if you have questions, raise your hand and if you can give your name too. Um, even if you don't give your name, that's all right. <laughs> J'en ai une autre. Vous avez dit aussi que les pratiques déloyales restaient au niveau des autorités de la concurrence. Les autorités de la concurrence produisent des sanctions. Or, on aurait pu imaginer, pour avoir une régulation la plus agile et la plus souple qui soit, d'avoir finalement un mécanisme de règlement différent pour produire de façon dynamique de nouvelles règles en fonction de d'événements qui peuvent, et de pratiques nouvellement déloyales, finalement, et au fur et à mesure, de produire des règles qui s'adapteraient, qui s'implanteraient sur l'ensemble du marché européen. Pourquoi ce, ce type d'outil n'a-t-il pas été retenu mais Je ne sais pas s'il n'a il a pas été précisé, mais je ne crois pas que ça exclut son utilisation. Personnellement, justement, comme... Oh, sorry, sorry, it's supposed to be in English. Uh, uh, So, personally, it would not disturb me at all to have the DMA group, whoever that is, dealing not only with the uh, unfair practices that are recognized in the DMA, but with the update of these unfair practices. I think that's part of the DMA that can be updated without taking a trip back to competition policy, since that European level, right, not the national level, since that's a competence we barely had and never really exercised anyway. Don't tell me you have no question. Yeah, yeah so Sure, I mean, we, we're going to speak among ourselves, but oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much for the great discussion. Um, I have a question. I don't know if it's a little bit aside of the of the main topic, but uh, in 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 the context of interoperability, there there has been. Uh, a great discussion these days about also like the the limits of interoperability in uh, in in for instance like freezing the state of the art of a given technology for instance like the for the encryption or or that encryption or for other uh, possible service uh, services uh, that somehow in, in in my mind is also conflicting is is conflicting with the fact that these are an asymmetric regulation that mandates like obligation for gatekeepers but not for like competitors uh, that have all the incentives to kind of differentiate and to invest and develop these kind of technologies even further and possibly also like keeping like this multi homing service without making full benefit of the interoperability benefit that they have and i was wondering whether you have any kind of Yeah, my opinion or 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 words about this discussion. So you have this this question also about special obligation for the gatekeepers, which are designated as gatekeepers. Yes, and uh, but, uh, uh, but the smaller one. I mean, that goes back to Pierre's uh, a broad, broader question about the treatment. Uh, in DMA, of course, is going to designate some large gatekeepers. But of course, smaller firms can do lots of damage. I mean, the case of most favored nation clauses is a good example of a behavior for which a big gatekeeper don't have, can do not much, they can do harm, but as much as uh, small gatekeepers. So, you know, difference with a competition policy which encompasses everybody. I mean, here it's limited to actually. It's closer to ex ante regulation, which allows you to get data and collect data, but it's, it raises the issue about who is big and who is small, and there is a very thin line, given that we don't want to, I don't know, maybe, maybe Pierre, you should, you should answer that question. Or, Sorry, yeah. just let me just rephrase yeah. just a little bit. It's 
the problem was uh, indeed whether small firms can actually be benefit in this beneficial in this case by developing on lines that are probably freezed by the standardization. Like if having a standard kind of uh, impede the gatekeepers to even further develop those, their technology in, on data encryption or, or other services, then you have like these fringe competitors that might actually keep on doing that. And 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 I recently assist to a to, to a great discussion about the limits of interoperability as harming innovation. That seems like well debatable. And 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 I was wondering whether you had some opinion. Yeah, no, it's a good concern, but I don't think it's a good answer, right? Uh, interoperability in industry where technology is mature is certainly a very good remedy. In uh, industry where technology changes fast, it depends on where does the technology change. Because in many industry, you can have lots of changes in technology, but you can still keep the same interfaces. So even in digital, what we would impose would only affect some type of innovation. So maybe encryption, where pro, uh, uh, progress into safeguarding the security on your platform might also make interoperability harder. Right, uh, but so I want to point out it's only for the specific type of innovation that the issue would arise, and I don't know enough about what the technical constraints are there to say anything more than that. Thank you. Yeah, maybe if I can jump in for a minute, I think I agree with Pierre. It's it's really, I, I, I don't find it extremely useful to discuss, you know interoperability or even full interoperability as a as a binary thing as a like you know do we have or do we not have interoperability i think it's you know there's a there's a very very broad spectrum of things you can do ways you can do it and and what you want to interpret and what you allow each platform to keep doing uh, on its own um it's also a question of what do you freeze in the standard and how do you allow the standard to keep improving uh, you know, even in, in, in telecom, right, we've not, you know, we've not been stuck back with 1G because they have been, you know, standardization effort and interoperability requirements. Um, so clearly, I think encryption is a, a difficult one. Um, but again, that does not mean that there isn't like, you know, a spectrum of things that one can do and, and ways you can uh, implement interoperability while still allowing uh, for uh, innovation, but it really requires to to get down to uh, the details. I have this question about friend and who is going to enforce access pricing. I mean, friend is a very vague thing that usually is enforced by courts, uh, but now we are going to get a regulator who is going to be able to do some access pricing. Also, I'm not sure on what basis it will do that, but that more generally raises the issue. The other issues which was mentioned on this is uh, now we we have to allocate between Digicom and Digicollect are my own preferences, but it's clear that there is, there's a lot of technical uh, issues to be solved. So we are going to, to have some kind of mix between the two, but, uh, but still the choice of where it's located is not going to be an occur. So, I don't know if any of you have some comments on what should be done. I, I, I can uh, take the question. I mean, I can uh, ask the question after you answer. No. <laughs> yeah, well, so uh, my name is uh, Sarah Lemaire. Uh, I'm a PhD here at uh, TSC. Uh, and I wanted to have a kind of your feeling about, uh, you know, do you think that the DMA is going to decrease the number of free services? Because in a way, uh, you know, companies won't be able to justify anymore that, you know, oh, but we have this free thing. So we, I mean, for instance, we have this free OS, so to finance it, we need to do this and that. So do you think it will have kind of a long-term impact on, you know, the number of uh, free things? That's a very hard question to 
to, to answer as an economist, because as you know, in a platform, everything is related, right? It was, it was your practices of the advertising market, the price that you charge on one side of the platform or, 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 or of the other. If you ask me, oh, you do something drastic on one side of the platform, or would happen on the other side, I could answer. But if you say, look, I mean, in the way you deal with people, your platform, you choose this one class, even if it makes you less profitable, it would not necessarily directly imply that then you would raise your price to consumer, right? Because that, that, that's, the, that's the reason this price is zero uh, in the first place. It's not a matter of whether you have higher or lower profits. It's a, it's a matter of optimal structure of your different instrument. On top of it, when you see zero prices, tell yourself that this is a corner solution, you probably not just at the corner, there's probably kind of room for things to change before you leave this corner. So, uh, you know, it's very speculative answer, but based on this kind of reasoning, I would say, no, I would not expect uh, this regulation to have a huge uh, effect on the amount of stuff that is there freely. Any other opinion on Sarah's question? Yes, it's better. Um, the regulation will, from my point of view, once come to these free services issue, it will come. Because there is something wrong in offering very vastly provided free services, because somebody is paying it. So I like your question. I think it should be an exam question. I think it should be an exam question. That's, 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 that's a very, uh, so you use it as an exam, and then when the student complain, you say, oh, you know, your former classmate came in. Yeah, yeah but Sarah has passed those exams a long time ago. So <laughs> next generation. Doshin. Yeah, since this is a postal economics conference, uh, I'd like to know more, more about uh, the challenges from Amazon to the to La Post and uh, what should be done to create a level uh, playing field. In fact, it is very simple that uh, these operator which is our first client, so we like him, uh, has just the same obligation as ourselves. So the same service, the same obligation. That is clear. Uh, respecting the same social and tax rules. You know? So, you know, I, I told you just before that we made significant progress. I will tell you a story. In October 2014, we had with other postal services CEO in Europe, a meeting with the former commission, uh, European Commission. And I was in charge to try to explain what was the same level playing field paradigm. And uh, the commissioner was very surprised because it was not an issue for him at this stage, not an issue. He saw us as old monopoly incumbent, just asking for more protection, which was not the case. Our case was not to be protected. We don't have any monopoly today. 
and everybody is switching from the letter to the email uh, or to the SMS. We try in 2014 to explain that the same level playing field would mean or will mean that everybody is respecting the same rules and the same duties. And I have to say that today with the DMA or with this future American law, we have made significant progress because both the politician and the regulation authorities are trying to put the same duties and obligation to all the players in the market. So for us, it's a big progress. We, are not, we don't need protection. We are knowing how to adapt ourselves. We just want the same level playing field, which does mean everybody is respecting the, 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 com the competition rules. Uh, am I clear? And, and that is key. That is totally key because when you are competing with a group as Amazon, which is one of the most powerful in the world, you need that they, ha they have the same duties and the same obligations that yourself. That is a very simple demand. And that is why I, I made this first conclusion. We have made significant progress, but it's not over. No, no, do you want to? So, sorry, I don't have the, all the words in English, but uh, um, the Amazon don't have any postal obligations and they deliver packets exactly like uh, La Poste. And uh, for instance, we don't regulate Amazon, we, re we have a regulation on, on La Poste. I just want to check if you have something to be added to what was said. Um, not necessarily. I think this is this is outside of my area of expertise. No more. We are tired after all those days of conferences. Any last word, the panelist? Yes, maybe. which is about challenge. These digital platforms are bringing significant progress in both the economy and the society. They are stimulating us and they are in fact stimulating us to change. That is very positive. At the same time, they are creating domination effect, which are issues not only for La Poste or other postal services, but for the whole economy. And I think that uh, the regulation authorities are in the process to adapt their rules and their policy to this uh, new economy. And I am finding that very positive. And for that, I think that those authorities, like us, will need more economic and psychological research on the behavior of these actors. So it's not only a business policy matter, it is also a research matter, as it is also a challenge for you as, uh, as academics uh, professional. That is my conclusion. Well, thank you, Philippe, and uh, on behalf of the TSE platform, I would like to thank the panelists and also all the participants to that conference. That was a great panel. I really appreciate it very much. And uh, Helmut Kremer is going to say a last word. Yeah, I would like to just uh, to say a few words of thanks. Uh, there are the list of people to thank would be too long to to mention, and so I, I will be brief. First of all, well, I would like all of you to come, and uh, uh, in spite of the uh, difficult context, it was nice to have a 
almost uh, in-person conference for a change. So this was uh, uh, very nice. Uh, I thank uh, la, the group La Poste for, their, uh, for making this conference possible via their uh, support. Uh, I uh, also thank uh, uh, specifically for the group La Poste, Claire, uh, for uh, being uh, uh, very... Uh, 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 she, she, she was... Uh, extremely helpful for uh, both the scientific and uh, practical part and so i don't know what i would have done uh, without her and uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, female support i don't see christelle but uh, 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 she's hiding i think uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I would like to to mention her it has been uh, this uh, conference has been very demanding on her. And uh, uh, so Claire works 24-7. Uh, uh, Christelle uh, had to uh, uh, work 23-6 uh, 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 for uh, making this uh, uh, conference possible. And so she was uh, very brilliant, very efficient, organized everything from A to Z. And uh, uh, with the help of... Uh, other assistants of, of TSC. So Marie-Hélène was also very, very active. I should also point her and, uh, well, I cannot uh, uh, point the whole list. I should also point out our computer uh, persons who were very helpful because in most places, uh, I've seen most places, IT people usually live in their own world and they're not uh, useful to, to the users, but which is not the case here. So they have been very helpful and uh, worked out uh, everything. So I, I'm forgetting people, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, I, I really had, to, these were the main uh, 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 persons with whom I wouldn't have. Uh, so for me, the job was actually rather easy because everything was like on automatic pilot because of, uh, 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 well, uh, Claire and Christelle, and so uh, thank you very much, and uh, so thanks to everyone. <laughs>